Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays at the De Young. I'm so pleased that you've joined us tonight. My name is Francesca D'Alessio. My team and I created Virtual Wednesday programs to encourage us all to connect through art in unexpected and meaningful ways. As we shelter in place, these weekly programs will introduce you to various artists, thought leaders, and museum staff. Join us every Wednesday at 5 p.m. as we aim to highlight unique viewpoints to reframe our exhibitions and collections. This program celebrates the launch of the De Young's new podcast series called Local Voices. The first eight episodes will focus on local artists inspired by Frida Kahlo. Our incredible host, Rio Yanez, has been a wonderful collaborator and thought partner. He was born and raised here in the Bay Area by art royalty. His mother, Yolanda Lopez, is a renowned painter, printmaker, and activist. And his father, Rene Yanez, a painter, performance artist, curator, and community activist, was one of the founders of Galleria de la Raza. Rene Yanez brought Frida Kahlo's art to the Bay Area for the first time in the 1970s. Let's explore the impact of Frida Kahlo's art locally and welcome Rio Yanez to Virtual Wednesdays. Hi everyone, I'm your host Rio Yanez and thank you for joining us for another Wednesday evening. Uh, right now I'm collaborating with the museum on the first iteration of Local Voices that celebrates artist Frida Kahlo and her impact on San Francisco. Um, I hosted uh, eight episodes uh, highlighting different Bay Area artist stories in their own voices that have been influenced by the iconic revolutionary Mexican artist. To complement those episodes, we hope that these uh, evening talks um, shed a little light, uh, illuminate more about us, our inspiration, uh, the passion for our crafts, um, how Frida has influenced kind of the, the cultural and creative landscape of the Bay Area, uh, and even my, my dad's work uh, in bringing Frida to uh, California and to the Bay Area. Uh, today, I am joined by two very special guests, uh, Linda Gamino, uh, Associate Director of Ensembles Palais Folklorico de San Francisco, and Fernando Escartiz, uh, Mixed Media Sculptor Artist. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Rio. So, Linda, um, we're going to start with you. I, Linda, you are such an iconic presence in the Bay Area art scene. I've you know, been familiar with your work for many, many years, and I'm very excited to be talking to you about it. Um, it's very special on a personal level because you worked with my dad uh, as one of his performance art Frida's. Uh, and I've been very fortunate to see you perform both as Frida and as a brilliant dancer and performer over the years. Um, let's start with how did you first become familiar or aware of Frida and her work? So Frida has been, I feel has always been a part of my life. I was first introduced to Frida at a very young age. I want to say maybe about four or five years old by my Tia Marta Estrella, who is um, also a San Francisco artist. And I have very vivid memories of visiting her at home and she would have Frida's work on her kitchen walls. And I remember participating in a carnival, um, in the carnival parade one year as Frida and she painted, you know, my first unibrow on me. So Frida's work and her imagery was something that just always seemed to be around me. And even though at a young age, I maybe did not understand a lot of her work, it in its own way was still something very comforting. The colors and the imagery itself, I associated with, you know, my, my family. And as a, as a dancer, as a performer, how, when did Frida first start to kind of influence your work and your choreography? So that started in my mid twenties. It happened through a pretty personal experience. When I was in my early twenties, I underwent my own 
um, back injury um, that didn't allow me to perform for about five years or so. And it, I, I was really, at that point, I was starting to try to accept a different life for myself and see that dance may not have been in my future. So I, I tried to dabble in, in different art forms, but nothing really spoke to me the way that dance always has. And so back in 2008, when the San Francisco MoMA was having their Frida Kahlo exhibit, I of course went into purchasing tickets. And then I saw your dad, um, Rene Yanez, was having one of his Frida casting calls. And so I thought, well, maybe, just maybe I'll show up and see what happens. And, you know, the worst that could happen is I just see the exhibit. But your dad, of course, being the person that he is, he's just had an open mind and an open heart and saw something in me and really gave me a chance to express myself and share Frida's story and what Frida has meant to me um, through a performance art piece to be featured there at the MoMA for the closing ceremony. And it was really after that, that I had a, just a new, it just lit that fire in me one more time. His belief in me really helped me believe in myself again. And I started to really focus on recovering and recuperating. And even when it came to physical therapy and to start dancing again, I put a lot of focus in my back <laughs> and strengthening my back and really using my back and my torso as an ex a real extension of, of expression. So even now as an instructor, when I teach and when I do warm-ups and, and things of that nature, I talk about my back all the time and talk about my dancers strengthening their back and projecting from, from their chest and their heart and their torso as much as I can. So it's something that is still very deep in me and really hasn't left. And how, how would you describe your, your dance aesthetic or, or style or, or influence? Oh, I'm, I've been influenced by many different things. By growing up here in San Francisco and growing up in the Mission District, just being surrounded by so many different cultures, the, the sights, the colors, the sounds, you know, the smells all of it has played its, its own role. And I was one of those dancers that when I grew up, whenever I saw something or heard something new, I wanted to try it. I wanted to try and understand it and see how it felt and, and how it would make me feel. And in its own way, it kind of helped me travel the world because even though I maybe couldn't go to Africa, I could take an Afro-Haitian class with a, a master teacher who, was willing to share so much with me besides just dance steps, but stories and reason behind the movements and show me how my body can really help ex you know, express my, my mood and anything else that I would have hoped to express. So in its own way, it's dance has made me feel kind of limitless and there are definitely things that I'm, more comfortable expressing through dance than sometimes even vocalizing. And so when you kind of that, that performance at the SF MoMA and, and how it kind of reinvigorated your, your interest and, and your, your passion for Frida, how did that kind of influence your work going forward from there? So it really, helped me just just be a little bit more as from a, as a choreographer more aware of the story in the past when i would choreograph a piece um it was very um structured in the sense that there is a beginning a middle and an end and it's one two three 
but with the MoMA performance, it really physically tested me. One, because um, Renee wanted such a long piece. It was approximately 10 minutes long. So it was learning how to capture and maintain the audience's attention for such a long period of time. Um, and of course, challenging myself, but not, you know, pushing myself over to the point of ex exhaustion. But then it also, um, when working on that piece, it allowed me to really reach in different directions and how I wanted to tell the story. I didn't just want a beginning, middle and an end. When I reached a certain point of the story, how was it going to keep moving in that direction? And how would it move in another direction? And again, how would I bring it all back together? Interesting, interesting. And, you know, how, I guess, aesthetically, you know, creatively, how have you kind of integrated either Frida's artwork, her, her cultural aesthetics, her fashion into your performance now as an artist? Oh, well, I've, I honestly feel that it's everywhere, especially as being um, an assistant director with Ensembles. It's so much of what we do. Um, our vestuario, I, I refer to it as vestuario, not costuming, because I really believe that the people that we're representing, the stories that we're sharing, that is very much who you know, those individuals are and what that story is, not necessarily um, something that is made up. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to me to make sure that, you know, we try to do things that are as authentic as possible. And we do a lot of research as far as, you know, vestuario design and footwork and choreography and things that are, of course, reflecting certain regions and certain areas, but also, how to make it um, for the stage and what type of stage and really um, how we evaluate the type of stage we're going to be performing on, the audience, and how we want the audience to really view the piece and also how we may want the audience to feel. And, you know, I... I'm very curious. So growing up, you know, in San Francisco, in the Mission District, were you aware of kind of Frida's shared history with the Bay Area and specifically with San Francisco? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think I, I kind of attribute that to maybe in its, its own weird way where Frida never really seemed far away from me. Frida didn't necessarily um, seem as an image of the past. I always kind of felt Frida in her own way was just kind of with me, almost like a, like a Jiminy Cricket or, you know, my, my inner conscience or something. She just always seemed there. And it was always cool to just know that the street that I was walking along or this building that I was standing in was the same buildings and streets that, you know, she was in. But of course, I mean, why wouldn't she be there? It's awesome. That, that's something that's always fascinated me. You know, I, I grew up around the corner from St. Luke's Hospital, which is where she miscarried. Um, and that's always kind of carried this really strong weight. I mean, I, I would look out my my window as a kid in the morning and I'd see that hospital standing there and it, it just my mind always went to that and um, even as an adult going into uh, San Francisco General seeing you know one of her original paintings of a doctor there um, in one of the lobbies at General it's a uh, it's always been kind of fascinating to see how intertwined they are um, I, I guess you know Tell, tell us a little bit about your your kind of what you're working on now as a, a dancer or as a creative person and kind of where you want to go as as an artist uh, and someone that that's definitely kind of carrying that that spirit with them. 
Oh, well, I, I'm definitely still very involved with Ensemble as a director. Um, I'm currently still teaching um, online classes for our dancers and we are, of course, you know, itching, all itching to get back into the studio. Um, there are a couple of pieces that I'm working on, Flocorico of dance pieces that I am working on. Um, but on a more personal level, I still am creating my own performance art. And one of the, um, I have to say, themes, I think, in, in the pieces that I create is really just perseverance and overcoming my own physical injuries that I've obtained through the years, you know, as just fluke accidents and as a dancer. Um, and really just test myself and, and push myself to express myself having the limitations that I've had with those injuries. So mm -hmm. I am creating um, a piece right now um, that originally I started working on years ago when I had my own leg injury and um, this new fire has been kind of lit to just kind of take that piece a little bit further. And what is your kind of process with that in, in kind of figuring out either like the narrative of the performance or the choreography of it? Um, well, there's, it, it's interesting because I don't necessarily plan, okay, well, I, this is what I want to do and this is how I'm, I'm going to get through it. Sometimes it's just, um, the inspiration just manifests itself mm -hmm. in, in its own strange way. But um, I know for this particular piece, I literally remember um, laying down on my bed and I was looking at my legs and one of my legs was actually physically smaller than the other one because of the injury. And as I looked down my legs and through my toes, I'm sure you all can imagine which Frida piece just, <laughs> um, struck through my mind and I just it just kind of started from there I started to just play with my feet again and look and see what they could do and just again that feeling of movement um just felt right and because I was going through that injury at that time it I just wanted to learn to move again you know, with, yeah. through my limitations. All right. Well, I'm very excited to see what you come up with next. Um, thank you for, for taking the time to share this with us, Linda. Sure. Thank you. Um, our other panelist is the amazing sculptor, Fernando Escartis. Um, he uh, has been doing, I think, something that that's been really ex exciting to me um and that's kind of creating these large scale sculptures um i uh recently saw some of his examples of his work that he did at the san francisco symphony um that really blew me away um and um fernando i um it's great to finally talk to you and i um Tell us a little bit about your background as an artist. I know in in the reading I've done on you, you're, you're very, very um, quick to mention your, your influences and your kind of creative heroes. So tell us a little bit about your, your background and uh, how you became a sculptor. Thank you, Rio, for the invitation. Uh, I, born, I, I was born in Mexico City and since I was a kid, uh, I visit very often the, um, the Blue House, the La Casa Azul, the Frida Kahlo. Uh, for me, it was a always very spectacular place, very magic place. And, and I think after I visit the house, I start very interested in the popular art, the Mexican popular art. Every house is, um, like unique, uh, unique uh, universe, and the Blue House is the universe of freedom, and I was inspired by that universe. Interesting. And 
what about Frida's work uh, initially caught your attention or spoke to you as an artist? Well, after uh, I visit the house, I'm more interested in, in his work. And especially one of the, or her paintings, the name is The Dream. It was uh, very, he made me very impressed for me. I identify myself with that because since I was a kid, I always dreamed with, with making things. And in and, 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 and that picture, uh, Frida is floating in the bed. So for me, the bed is, is a, a very important place because the ideas and dreams born in the bed. Interesting. Um, talk a little bit more about that symbolism because I, I know it's um, part of, you know, it's been part of her process and, and kind of a lot of her work kind of was centered around that bed. Um, like, what does that, that mean to you as, as part of her process, but also visually being represented in her work? Well, that, it, that, that uh, picture f uh, for me is symbol is freedom. This uh, floating and, and he uh, has a freedom. And for me, was a, I feel freedom to create um, things. And... I, I'm I'm kind of curious as because I know you spent time uh, working with the symphony. You did an amazing display of Katrina's for the San Francisco Symphony, and spending time in here in the United States and in Mexico. Do you what is the difference to you between how Frida is perceived uh, there and how she is perceived here in the United States? I feel this. It's the same. People love Frida here, and people love Frida in Mexico. Uh, I don't see any difference uh, between Mexico and, and San Francisco. Uh, when you walk in the streets uh, here in San Francisco, you can feel Frida everywhere. And, and when you are in Mexico City, it's the same. So I don't think so. It's, for me, I don't feel a difference. I, I think both places, people love Frida. And in your, your work uh, dealing with Frida and her, her iconography and her imagery, I, that large portrait of Frida and Diego, tell me a little bit about that, that inspiration um, and the motivation to create that piece. Yes, that one was a commission for the Mexican consul in San Francisco, Mrs. Uh, Remedios Gomez, the consul from Mexico. She she ha, she won has a photo boot for this year. They call the Mexican year in San Francisco, the 2020, the year uh, the year in Mexico in San Francisco. And and she won a photo book in the consulate. So I have the idea to create this uh, portrait with Diego and Frida, because first of all the, the the original painting is here in San Francisco MoMA, and the second one. Frida paint when she was living here in 1931. So I decided to, to create that, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, picture. I really love uh, work like people can in, in, inter, interact uh, with the piece. Mm -hmm. So I always like that kind of work, like people can, can interact with the piece. And here, people can take pictures. They can be between Frida and Diego. Interesting. Now, what was your, your process uh, in creating that piece uh, in terms of building the figures? What, what was the, the skeleton and how did you kind of bring those figures to life in your process? I like to use... Uh, all kind of materials uh, for that piece. Right now, I'm working a lot with paper, mache, styrofoam. It's, it's very easy to create a very big uh, pieces, very huge pieces. So that particular piece is uh, styrofoam, wood frame, and paper covered with paper mache. Interesting. Um, another piece I'm I'm hoping to hear a little bit more on was your. Um, your tree of life that you did uh, that was very specific to San Francisco. There's uh, a really beautiful portrayal of, of Frida and Diego and, and 
uh, it kind of blossoms out to see kind of other other facets of Mexican history and culture, but also kind of incorporating local motifs. Can you talk a little bit about that one as well? Yes, that one was a um, uh, commission for the, um, what is it? The Public Policy Institute, California. Mm -hmm. They want to celebrate the brother hook between Mexico and San Francisco. So when they when they when they asked me to create something for the lobby in the, in the building, I had the idea to create the tree of life because um, you can you can put too many uh, histories in in one place. So my idea was to create the tree of life, and I start from the um, from the first building here in San Francisco was the. Mission Dolores, and to then the Tree of Life has a different kind of, um, how can I say, elements, very important, like Day of the Dead, the Mission Street, Diego and Frida, the time they was here, um, the, the gastronomy, the food, and the last piece I think is, um, I forget the name for this guy, the, the dancer, uh, sorry, I forgot the, the, the name. Mm -hmm. But the tree and, and the last piece, the tree opened in two pieces and has a bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. For, uh, the, what, what bridge doing is uh, connecting two different um, places. So for me, it's the connection Mexico and, and San Francisco. Beautiful. And when, when you're starting a piece like that, or, or like the El Sueño um, sculpture, where do you start just in terms of design? Is there a, a specific narrative that, you know, you really want to tell? Does it begin with uh, wanting to work with certain materials? Or is it having like a sketch that you bring to life? What is, how, how do you generate a new piece in your process? Well, that's why I love that uh, uh, portrait for Frida because all my ideas come, especially at night time, when uh, when someone tell me like they they, they want uh, something. I, in that moment, I don't have idea what I will do, but when when I'm going to bed before I sleep, always the ideas come to me. It's like a look like a someone tell you what you have to do. And at the same time, the idea comes with all the, with all the process. It's, it's, it's funny how the ideas come to me. And, and look like a, something show me everything, the, the, the process, what materials I will use, and, and the idea. So I, I do trial, trials sometimes, but the idea is always here. And in born, especially born in, in bed. Wow. And uh, when you came to San Francisco, uh, or w when you've come to the Bay Area, uh, are, were you aware of Frida's local history, um, kind of the work that was either created uh, by Frida here in San Francisco, or some of the locations where she and Diego had major milestones? I was not uh, very very sure uh, in in the beginning. Then after I I, I start learning more about uh, the life uh, Frida has here in San Francisco with Diego. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, I think to to kind of wrap it up. Um, Fernando, uh, I know in your, your podcast you'd, and other interviews, you've mentioned uh, your admiration for Mexican artist Pedro Linares um, and his Alebrijes. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any other um, artists that kind of are inspiring you lately, anyone that you could direct our audience to check out. Well, what's, uh, the first thing... Uh, Call my attention in, 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 in the blue house was a big skeleton hanging in the in the walls. Mm -hmm. And in, in that time I didn't know 
some of these pieces was making by Pedro Linares. A uh, couple of years later, when I meet the, when I seen the, the Alebrijes the first time, I, I want to learn more about the Alebrijes and, and I find the, the um, Pedro Linares was the creator for these uh, beautiful figures. And in another time when I'm back to the, to the Blue House, someone tell me like uh, it was making by Pedro Linares. So I really love these two completely different works, but it was for the same person. Interesting. And are there, um, is there another more contemporary artist that is uh, doing something that's inspiring you lately uh, that you'd like to point our audience towards? Yes, when I decided to, to be an, uh, an artist, uh, it was after I met uh, Enrique Miralda Buñez, uh, famous sculptor in Mexico. And I was, I, I met him in a, in a party uh, in Cuernavaca, and he shows his studio. And in a week after that, I was working with him. So my first idea was, uh, I was in the school to, to study architect, but after I meet uh, Enrique, I decided to, to start uh, to going for that way. All right. And um, lastly, Fernando, is there um, another project that you have on the horizon? What, what are you working on next uh, in terms of creative work? I could uh, finish a big, 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 big uh, coronavirus. And in and, and the top, there are uh, superheroes. It's just to, to thank the, the um, essential workers and the first respondents. So the piece is, is, is ready. I, with, we who's finished this yesterday. Very cool, very cool. Um, and lastly, um, I'm, I'm just very, very curious. Can you tell us just a little bit about your studio uh, in terms of the, the architecture, the design? Um, it, it's, it definitely looks very different from the studios we see here in the States. So I'd, I'd love it if you just share with us uh, a little bit about your, the studio behind you. Yes, uh, you are welcome to come anytime. I'd, I like to work, uh, like I say, my, my work is definitely inspired by the Mexican culture. So when I create this space, sometimes you feel like you can be in, in Mexico, but also you can be in San Francisco. So for, for me to, to, to work better, probably I can say that, I have to be around uh, strong colors of, of, of uh, things like remind me my 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 past. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, and Linda, uh, one last question for you. Sure. Can you uh, share with our audience uh, either a visual or performing artist? that has been inspiring to you lately and you, you'd like to put our put us up on and let us know to check out <laughs> um a visual performing artist um you know one visual artist that um has um been very inspiring to me over the years, especially now is um, an old schoolmate of mine that I attended Soda with, who is a bit of a San Francisco icon in um, her own right is Maria Perez Wong. Um, she is someone who just has such an incredible story um, in her own um, right and her work, her messages, um, and just how much of a positive role model she is. I, she's someone that I always keep an eye on and in her own way just kind of pushes me to want to continue to push myself artistically and to challenge myself with what I hope to portray and the messages that I, I want to get across. So I'm 
you know, I'm always keeping my eye, on, my eye out on my girl and what she's doing. And I'm just so immensely proud of all that she's accomplished. All right. Well, thank you so much, Linda. I feel like that's the perfect note to go out on. Uh, Marina has a beautiful Frida mural on 25th and Orange in the Mission District, so definitely check that out. Um, we want to thank everyone for tuning in and spending time with us. I invite you to check out Local Voices Celebrating Frida Kahlo podcast, now available on the Fine Art Museum SoundCloud and Spotify, with new episodes releasing every Monday. Frida Kahlo Appearances Can Be Deceiving is now on view at the De Young Museum. The museums have reopened with safety guidelines to ensure that we all return to a safe and healthy environment to learn more. Visit the De Young, excuse me, to learn more, visit deyoungmuseum.org slash Kahlo dash safety. And if you're able to, we invite you to purchase a ticket to see the exhibition. Uh, I am so excited to finally check out the show and um, very exciting that there's a, a safe way to do so. Uh, all tickets will be timed and are selling out fast, so we recommend booking your tickets in advance at tickets.famsf.org. This is Rio Yanez saying, may your houses be blue and your Diegos be faithful. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Rio, and thank you, everyone. That was so much fun. Frida Kahlo, Appearances Can Be Deceiving, is now on view at the De Young Museum. Tickets are selling out fast, so we recommend booking your tickets in advance online at tickets.famsf.org. Again, that's tickets.famsf.org. And please check out our podcast, Local Voices, on anchor.fm backslash famsf. Again, our podcast, Local Voices, can be found at anchor.fm slash famsf. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.